Maybe it's just Natalia and Melissa. I know. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I'm in yes. Arizona. I don't know if that's more. I know. It's blue, 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 we we both decide. left. I'm in Georgia. We're on the news a lot <laughs> these days. <laughs> I was in Georgia. Whoop, whoop. That's and right. Before that, I was in South Dakota. So we got a lot of states covered. You're all over the place. Massachusetts, Detroit. Woo. Yeah, okay. so if you want, as yeah. we just put it here, you want to drop in the chat where you yeah. are from, where you live now, right? Those may be different. Feel free to drop <laughs> another AZ, baby. <laughs> yes. I see one of my MA students, Chantilly. <laughs> yes. Oh, Brazil. Yeah. Man. Felipe. I think he gets the farthest. Is that? <laughs> so far. Awesome. Well, let's go. Yay. Atlanta. Hola, Joe. I didn't even see you. But I haven't scrolled down. All I can see is the first six people. <laughs> so I've left it there. Yay. Well, let's roll. It's 7.05, right? Um, I'm super excited that you guys can join us. Um, and my name is Meredith White. I'm just outside of uh, Atlanta, Georgia in Gwinnett County. I teach Spanish. And um, on behalf of FLAG, on behalf of uh, SCOLT, because our conference this year, the Georgia conference is the FLAG SCOLT combo conference. So I don't speak for SCOLT, but on behalf of just the whole um, kind of organizational conglomerate, we're super excited that you're here. We're super excited that Chris is here. And, um, you know, for this series, we basically said, no, you know, nothing is there's nothing we can't talk about. So we've got some really, really um, intriguing conversations. And I know a lot of people have um, reached out because a lot of times conversations centered around um, topics that aren't like, you know, you go to sessions and it's like 100 games in 100 minutes, how to get them talking tomorrow. But when you want the deeper kind of stuff, we all need that, right? We all, we all need the 100 friggin anything, you know, like give me anything I can do tomorrow. Um, but also there are those process-based things that take time that, that need explanation that you've got to be really careful with, I think, and really honor in a lot of different ways. And so I'm super excited that we have a lot of those um, topics in this series. And I'm just really grateful for Chris and his time, um, their time, and all of just all of the, I don't know, I'm excited about all of the kind of community pieces that are going to come together and, and hopefully we get some questions answered and some you know, some, some thoughts provoked and all of that. Chris, would you like to take it away? I'm going to take, or PS, I will take um, questions in the chat. So what we're going to do is, uh, again, this is very casual as it's been the last couple of weeks. If you didn't get an email about the last two, sorry about that. Um, Google spreadsheet glitch, but I got to figure it out. Uh, the glitch was me. I was the glitch. And um, so this is very casual. Chris is going to kind of go through his material. If you have questions, throughout a lot of the questions will be answered you know as you go so uh, a lot of them are obviously you know pre-thought out and all those kind of things so um if you want to pop them in the chat i'm just going to keep compiling them and then if you've ever been to an ed camp and you see how they make the topics like which ones overlap and that kind of thing if i see repeaters i'll just kind of glom them together and do the possibly best i very can um to keep them consolidated and then in a little while, we'll just rock and roll with some Q and A and um, go from there. So you'll see your ability to unmute yourself now for our now joiners go away, but then it can come back later if we want it to. Chris, go for it. It's all yours, man. Awesome. Thank you everyone for coming in general and especially on tonight of all nights. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on that, but I do like to start conversations with this like this with a reminder about the fact that social justice work is always ongoing. There is going to be no end to the process of liberation. And process and product are always going to be entangled in this type of work. The idea that equity and justice is something that we can get done through checklists and toolkits and examples is a desire that's rooted in normativity and in whiteness. Instead of trying to do that, what we're going to do today is to try to begin to respond to this impotence, impetus for equity and justice by looking at some of the ways that trans-affirming pedagogies and language can be made manifest in our classrooms. 
From there, you should have the tools that you need to begin to work with the materials included in the very robust handout. You'll have a few chances to get that link and download a copy. Um, you signed up for an hour, but if we're going to be accomplices in equity and justice, we're going to have to learn to exist in community with our trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming students and colleagues. That entails reframing today as an opening of a conversation rather than as a 60 minute crash course in how to do this. That also requires that we release the idea that things can be fixed. And instead we sit and we learn to be comfortable with being very uncomfortable at times. So that's sort of my contextualizing. If it will go, we will be good. Next slide, please. Thank you, computer. So, we're all definitely entering into tonight's conversation and the general project of gender just language teaching from various levels of experience, both in terms of fluency and trans affirming and queer inflected pedagogies and in terms of our own gendered positionalities and history. And all of that is okay. You are not behind. That is not a thing in queer pedagogy. I'll tell you why in a minute. For many of us, including for our queer identified students, today's conversation could be summarized as being about inclusivity. And that I think is plenty of reason enough for us all to be here. But I would argue that the goals of trans affirming language pedagogies should be much broader. Learning how to talk critically and fluently about all aspects of human diversity is really just like intercultural literacy in today's society. This is something that we have to learn how to do to be able to be full and active citizens. So how do we start thinking about teaching both to and about trans people in language classes? Trans affirming queer and queer based pedagogies, ooh, what a mouthful, gives us a really good start at making explicit hidden curriculum, power structures, and personally held biases. And it can be useful in searching for gender liberation within and alongside anti-racist and decolonial pedagogical strategies, because these forms of oppression are inextricably linked. Uh, oops, yeah. uh, and so everything we know in queer applied linguistics also tells us that we as language educators need this frame as we compensate for the existing gaps in our training and our materials. Broadly speaking, queer and queer based pedagogies entail questioning norms and showing how problematic identity categories are. Here we want to show students that norms are something we create and collectively negotiate as culturally situated speech communities. And we also want to show them that all classification systems are oversimplifications of our complex realities. We're teaching our students uh, to always be asking why the world is the way that it is who benefits from that status quo, and how to imagine alternatives. It's not just when it comes to gender and sexuality. So what does this look like in real time for our pedagogical goals to be about making students aware of queer lives and concerns, and to make our classrooms more inclusive for students of all genders? Perhaps most importantly, we have to explore with and alongside our students, which means we have to let go of any urge to perform the role of queer expert in favor of focusing on deep, critical and sustained engagement with queer lives and concerns. This allows us to decenter power in our classroom. And so in this way, it's an iterative, self-reflective and co-constructive pedagogy, not any sort of exhaustive knowledge that is needed to create conditions for meaningful inclusion and representation. This focus on critical self-reflective practice for everyone further makes clear that questioning language the language class, oh, sorry, not questioning, queering, the, makes clear that the process of queering the language classroom is continuous and that it's a collective responsibility that can't be left to insiders alone and can't be left to the teacher alone. In this process, we have to uh, avoid sort of a festival and foods type of multiculturalism. We have to value and normalize the inclusion of trans people in our everyday curriculum. This entails developing critical analytical lenses with our students where we pick apart and draw attention to how normative discourses silence certain lives. 
our avoiding of a sort of trans day or trans week and this type of tokenization has to be carried through into our object objectives and our assessments. After all, what is assessed, what is measured is what ends up being valued, even if we hate that, right? Um, and making queerness visible in our language learning goals helps desensationalize LGBTQ content and demonstrates that queerness and identity are valued parts of the language learning process. Our goal here is not to have an evangelizing mission of changing hearts and minds. It's about cultivating an inclusive learning community where all students are met with respect and where we actively work to dismantle marginalization, violence, and oppression without reifying discourses that limit our understandings of trans people to this domain. In the words of Zina Galazzo, we may be from oppression, but we are not constituted solely of oppression. At its most basic level, this implies resisting cisnormativity and assuming that trans people are present, whether we're aware of it or not. Just as visibility alone doesn't give us liberation, we cannot know and we don't need to know someone's existence as trans in order to unscript gender in our classrooms and in our pedagogies. Any trans affirming pedagogy must always be trans affirming. Centering on these theoretical underpinnings, I want us to now look through some illustrative ways of concretely situating trans people in language classrooms how to develop structures, practices, and critical habits of mind in ways that create visibility and value around trans lives. As there's no one way to embody queerness or to do trans affirming pedagogy, each person is going to have to adapt these principles, strategies, and commitments to be locally relevant and to be locally feasible. You know your contexts, You'll have to think through, and we can think through together at the end, how you might make this work where you are. As you do that, you're going to have to dialogue with all stakeholder, stakeholders and prioritize trans students without tokenizing them or putting the onus of queering the classroom on them, whether or not they choose to disclose. Remember, we don't have to know if anyone trans is in our classroom in order to do this work. I also want to quickly flag for you the fact that there are lots of definitions, excellent resources for anyone who might want a bit more general training. We don't have a ton of time, so I want to dive right into it. But if this is moving quickly for you, there is a lot to pick apart and digest over the long term. You follow me on social media and you'll get lots of invitations to do things like this. So don't feel like if you don't get it all today, you haven't gotten anything, I want to combat that very strongly. Um, so as we move forward, I'm going to be talking about French. because That's what I research, that's what I speak, that's what I teach. But you should be able to take what I'm talking about and apply it to whatever language you teach. And I've given you resources in the handout to help you do that. So they will see that there are living folders for German, Spanish, Italian, Hebrew. If you teach it, I probably have a folder for it. And if I don't have a folder for it, you have my email. I will help you find some resources to get started, okay? So there are things out there and we can do this. Um, keep in mind that this is just the start of your investment in trans affirming pedagogy. Let me keep it moving before I dilly dally all day on one slide. How do we take this into theory into practice? We can start by setting expectations for respect and signaling inclusivity. Signaling can be important. So long as it's not hollow and the only thing we do. We have to follow up by inviting sharing pronouns and agreements via private voluntary first day surveys, for example, as opposed to making any public demands. You have a few examples of how I begin inviting sharing pronouns and agreements in your handout. This can be in statements on syllabi and course policies that you then follow up in class on. It can be on assignment and assessment headers. Any approach should have in common is that it's a private invitation. It's voluntary and it doesn't make a public demand. So 
all of that's a good first step. But if we stop at signaling, or if we even stop at pronouns, we've really mistaken the meaning of trans-affirming pedagogy. This is about a fundamental shift in our relationship to normativity. And it's about systematically recognizing, including, and valuing trans and non-binary individuals. Let's illustrate what I mean by looking at how we might introduce greetings in a first semester, very beginning French class. So I'm gonna pull examples from May Week. It could really be any textbook. I wanna make sure you know, I have challenges with pretty much all of them equally. So what's problematic and has to be called out here? Madame and Monsieur. We want to, at a minimum, do Monsieur, Madame, et pour les personnes non binaires, signaling at least that we are thinking about this and offering a possibility to open up a conversation about the cultural role of honorifics and the creativity that is inherent in non-binary language. If we have uh, access to the forms, we could do even better and add in mix, which appears to be gaining traction in non-binary Francophone communities. And there's also a neologism that I've seen much less mondam. It's simple, but it lays a foundation that opens up language learning to people who have felt excluded for a very long time. Oh, I heard someone say, what if I don't have any non-binary students? You already remember. We don't have to have any, and we can't ever know. So similarly, we have to watch for and call out moments where grammatical gender is being pre presented as though it's embodied social gender. Here we see the masculine and feminine being presented as natural classes and being a focus and, and the focus on the gender of humans. This misses an opportunity for us to question what exactly do we mean when we're talking about gender? and to explain that grammatical gender may or may not coincide with sociocultural understandings of gender. Gender agreement or accord per se is not necessarily problematic. The problem is that gender categories like masculine and feminine are made to connect back to inherent characteristics of people in a way that they aren't with objects. And in this sense, Grammatical gender and social gender are not really the same thing at all, except that they both follow similar rules. And so we end up confusing and conflating them. So what can we do about this? None of us has the time to write a textbook today, I don't think. If you do call me up, I have some ideas. What can we do shy of doing that? It might be as simple as noting this difference for your students. For example, I have this paragraph in the handout where I send students a note that points out the disconnect between grammatical and social gender. I tell them about Naganjit Mary, which has 15 noun classes, Zulu, which has 16 noun classes. And that way they start to get a realization that, hmm, something doesn't quite match up. I point out that they already think it's weird that a chair should be feminine. And so students are going, oh, yeah, I guess a lot of strange things are already happening. And I also point out to them the term non-binaire so that then throughout class, I can just quickly use the term every time non-binarity comes up as relevant. It also reiterates any discussions that we've had about how our classroom community will be working to be inclusive. And it honors the challenges and nascency of these forms. As we start to seek out and upend gender in our classroom, and we're looking for these norm normativities, we might begin to realize that many of the ways that we're teaching and reinforcing grammatical gender conflates it with social gender. If we have something like visual vocabulary pages or uh, this sort of explanation, there are simple solutions to move away from this kind of color coding, this sort of conflation. So we can start by removing the symbols don't make any overt um, reference to social gender. And then we can get rid of the more implicit 
references to gender by changing the colors. They still function as memory aids. We still communicate the same information, but without those unhelpful conflations. We could take it one step further and move away from using masculine and feminine labels and instead refer to these by category un and category une, which actually focuses student attention on how they'll use these forms rather than focusing on the names of categories that are likely to cause more problematic conflation than they are to be useful. Simple shifts, not fundamental shifts, but ones that make very big differences in how students are relating to language. So when I say that linguistic inclusion has to be part of a broader ethos regarding gender in the classroom, this is exactly what I mean. Are we using stereotypes of colors and ways that conflate grammatical and social gender? Could we use alternatives that don't risk reifying normative conceptions of social gender? Broadly, are we avoiding reifying normativities as much as we can? And then when they do come up, are we critiquing them with our students? Asking about what the status quo is, asking how it got to be that way, why it is maintained, who's benefiting, who's being disadvantaged, and what systems or practices are maintaining it. Do we do things like invite sharing pronouns and agreements via, via uh, private and voluntary methods? And is this ethos reflected in the entire course experience for our students? For example, does this systematically carry into our assessment practices? through something like including names, pronouns, and agreements on assignment headers. Inclusionary pedagogy is about seeking out, laying bare, and upending all forms of normativity. As we explore how the normativities that underlie our own experiences can creep up into our pedagogical practice, it becomes evident that linguistic forms alone are not going to give us liberation. They are a critical but singular part of trans-affirming classrooms. Yet without transforming language, we'd be pretty hard pressed to make visible the relevance of trans lives and concerns throughout the curriculum. We'd be hard pressed to engage with the actual lives of the people we're purporting to include and aiming to linguistically represent. And most of all, we'd be hard pressed to treat gender as a social and political issue that is structural. So without any more and about, let's look at some non-binary language forms that exist in French and use it as an example to think about how we can offer our students linguistic possibilities for including non-binary experiences of the world rather than prescribing norms that would reproduce the violence that they're intended to subvert. So let's look quickly at pronouns. This might feel real easily solved in English, but it's very, fairly illustrative of the variability and respect for individual agency that characterizes non-binary language. In English, we have multiple gender neutral pronouns like Z, but the singular they has become recognized as one of the most popular. In French, there's a lot more variation that persists. So looking at three studies, for example, we have more than 30 different options. And despite this variety, all three identify yel as the most frequently used and widely recognized pronoun in French. Yel does have its limitations. It originates from the merging of binary il, which traditionally gestures at masculinity, and binary elle, which gestures at femininity. And so it's not ideologically really getting us away from binary constructions of gender. But it does have the advantage of being highly comprehensible, both in community and by people who have a lot less familiarity with trans community. For all, for people who are looking for a clearer departure of the binary, we have ol and al. So ol, ol in these variations and al. They're some of the more used and more comprehensible neo pronouns. French linguist Alfrats also has proposed a non-modular approach, what um, they call the AL system. And it's a very elegant solution, but one that I have not seen used in any of my data. So having some pronoun options, we're moving right along, except we still can't make hardly any sentences because there's still the question of agreements. And that's not any 
less complicated of a task. There's more, uh, there's, there's numerous potential for different combinations of agreement pairs. If we take a look at my data, we can sort of note that one of the most popular ways of doing this is by either using a period, a mid dot, a hyphen, or a slash between the two traditional uh, pairs, again, combining the um, sort of standard masculine and feminine forms. And it's the same strategy you saw in that ally sticker I popped up earlier. It's easy to understand, ideologically problematic, and it's impossible to pronounce. So uh, one of my participants called it what I can only sum up as a hot spoken mess. And that's absolutely what it is. We have to get creative in oral communication, which is good for students anyways, because they need to learn how to do circumlocution. They need to learn how to work when they don't know the words, right? So it's fostering those things that we already want them to learn. When it comes to oral communication, we have three big strategies. The first is using adjectives that are invariable. So I would use drôle no matter what gender the person is I'm describing or something that's phonetically equivalent in their binary forms. Gentil, gentil sounds the same. You couldn't make a difference. You wouldn't be able to infer anything about gender. So those are great solutions. If that doesn't work, we can try paraphrasing to avoid adjectives that are marking gender differently. If that still doesn't work, I can start the sentence and use the subject quelqu'un, which is always grammatically masculine, no matter who we're talking about or une personne, which is always feminine, no matter who we're talking about. And if that still doesn't work, we have neologisms. It's a last resort because there's not a lot of consensus as to what forms these new words should take. And it tends to be harder to pin down, which we can talk later about how that's perfectly descriptive of sort of trans communities writ large. I'm only gonna be able to scratch the surface today when it comes to non-binary language forms but that might be awfully fitting. Today's talk is not so much about these nuts and bolts, some of which are going to change over time and definitely change from one language to the other. And it's more about a broader shift in thinking about what language, about whose language we're giving value to in our classrooms. We can choose instructed forms and structures based on naturally occurring language data, as opposed to prescriptive grammar, we can reflect on language as a complex adaptive system, and we can disrupt ideologies that frame diversity as suspect and problematic. It's true that as we move from linguistic observation towards teaching, we have to balance this desire to make it simple and understandable for students and to hold the complexities of um, what really exists on the ground in queer and trans communities. When it comes to language use, community consensus is difficult to pin down by design because overall community needs focus on respecting individual agency to guard against a third category problem where we have masculine, feminine, and then one option for non-binary that is then able to be used to continue to impose categorization with the power to oppress and marginalize. Trans is a very, very diverse category that catches a lot of positionality. And so really these three categories don't contend well with the various differences that exist across them. I continue to ramble. What do we do? What we can do is we can start with the forms that have been empirically among the most frequently used. So we can use the data to pick where we begin and we can carefully frame that introduction with very explicit conversations about normativity and language, about linguistic autonomy and the right to self-definition. When we introduce non-binary language, we have to dialogue with students about how variable it is and how it changes so that students are equipped with both the language and the symbolic competence that they're going to need in order to advocate for themselves and others. We have to prepare our students for the moment when someone says to them, that's not French, that's not Spanish, that's not German. What a powerful moment it is when a student can say back, yeah, I know this does not fit with ideologies of standard French, Spanish, German, whatever the language is, but they do exist. 
These framing conversations are about making it clear to students the importance of gender in the process of co-constructing second language self. So I wanna slide in a few more ideas about how we can teach using non-binary language forms before we have our chat together. One thing that we can do, verb charts. A lot of us are using them, put in non-binary forms and you can start by marking them as masculine, feminine, non-binary. And as students start to recognize the patterned order, you can then remove it and, the, and, and continue normalizing its presence all the time without qualifiers. We've talked about adding in mix whenever honorifics come up, but we'd also should be careful to add in vocabulary like adelf when we cover families and relationships. We talked about working with what students are already familiar with and opening up the breadth of their repertoires from there. So we can take that same scaffolding approach with how we introduce these language forms in the classroom. By leveraging the fame of well-known Anglophones who use non-binary pronouns in introductory examples, followed by non-binary Francophones, we're able to take um, this rejection of a trans day, a trans week, any sort of little isolated incidents and weave it into the curriculum in direct connection with our language learning goals. And in that way, we get to avoid tokenization, marginalization, and sensationalism. And as we actually engage with the lives of real trans and non-binary people, we're going to quickly be able to go beyond allegories or symbols of gender non-normativity. And instead, we get to treat gender as the structure, structural, social, and political issue that it is. Taking this example, just by talking about Sam Smith or Asia, Kill Ooh, Asia, one more time, Asia Kate Dillon, there we go. Ooh, in French, we have to acknowledge how personal, personal pronouns can be. As many as our students will start to realize how quickly assumptions happen. And as we talk about someone like Antonin Lu we have to underscore and point out the fact that not all non-binary people use non-binary pronouns. We're afforded possibilities to hold loosely the complexity of trans languages while tightly weaving these knowledges into our learning objectives. As we advance from introductory level language courses and students are able to do more with language, we can use academic work, popular media, artistic productions, online media, and other work that centers the voices and perspectives of trans people in the languages we teach. There are infinite ways that we can bring trans people and topics into the full spectrum of coursework that we teach while being careful to prioritize in community voices. So in business French, we might talk about diversity in the workplace or how we do honorifics on CVs. In courses about education, we might talk about um, particular laws or instances that are brought up. In politics, we might bring up famous politicians who are trans. In the arts, we might either specifically looking at trans art, or we might pick, okay, let's say we're doing something on rock music already. Put someone in, note it for students. Let it come up as it comes up. If you let it come up, it will start to come up everywhere the more that you know. We know that ready-made educational materials that include trans-affirming content are slim to non-existent. And so we can actively practice respectful, intentional listening and come to know trans people. And this will help us better create conditions for language learning that are equitable, just, and affirming with regard to gender. This listening to building connections with and peripherally participating in trans communities and organizations can be among the best ways to find resources and, real, and realia, but it has to be deliberately and unequivocally ethical. Particularly for people who aren't trans non-binary or gender non-conforming themselves, it's important to safeguard against common pitfalls while seeking to be accomplices in equity and justice. Specifically, under no circumstances should you ask trans people to educate you if they themselves have not chosen to be activist educators in the context in which you're interacting. Honor that being publicly trans often comes at great personal cost. Further, take care not to insert yourself in conversations and spaces that are intended only for members of a community to which you do not belong. 
listen more than you speak. Minoritized individuals are often unheard, but we are not voiceless. And when you make a mistake, apologize succinctly, something like, I'm sorry, thanks for correcting me, and move forward. Use the correct pronouns, avoid the transphobic phrase. Don't make an excuse and don't ask people to take on your feelings. I'm gonna point out Meredith, you'll forgive me. Meredith earlier, heed me, then they'd me. And it's actually fine because I don't mind either, but that would be the perfect way to do it if you're like, oh, I said the wrong one. You fix it and you keep going. Nobody wants it to become a big deal and it's okay. We make mistakes, fix it and commit to doing better. Li existing in solidarity means listening, being accountable, owning the need to engage in self-reflection and committing to doing better as you learn. My wife often reminds me, forgive yourself for making the decisions that you made when you were the person you were yesterday and then move forward. So that's something I like to borrow from her. She's much sager than me as most K-12 educators are. Um, so mindful of these principles, what do we do with that? Like this, that, that got a little uh, pre-search. So now what? Well, we can look at where are we getting our information about trans people from? Do we actually engage with news media outlets that tend to be run and owned and authored by trans people? That's ideal. If not, do we at least have queer people in our lives telling us some things? In our social network, are we following trans activists? There are a lot of people screaming from the rooftops begging you to listen to them. So feel free to take advantage of the people who are volunteering to be educators and activists. As you get to know these people, this is something you can invite your students into through activities, assignments, and discussions. When I say learning with, you could, for example, embed this in a larger discussion where students and educators do something like a web quest to explore inclusive and non-binary linguistic strategies in the target language. We want to make sure we're following our earlier principles. Oops, nope, yep, those, those principles. But um, we can build together, learn together, admit what we don't know. Students tend to get invested. They tend to know a lot of things that we don't even realize they know. And this is one of those beautiful moments, I think, for learning together. We do even better if we take this and we're sure not to sensationalize it by using WebQuest to maybe explore some other form of linguistic diversity as well, right? We could talk about use slang, regional differences. And in that way, it sort of becomes just a normal part about talking about the different ways that people can exist in the world. We can also make sure we find um, media for any sort of genres of media that we're engaging with, right? Comics, blogs, and include trans voices so that we can bring together existing foci with new understandings gained from the artist or author's voice. In a writing focused course, this could be framed as like genre or multi literacy pedagogies where work by trans people is included alongside others. In any course with presentational speaking, we could teach the genre of a TED talk. We might also leverage videos like something, the Fondation Emergence has a devoir de mémoire, uh, duty to remembrance, duty to remembering an aging campaign, campaign. And those might interface a little bit with things that we're already doing in our classes. The ways in which gender diversity can be made relevant to second language classrooms are as limitless as the ways in which gender inflects the lives cultures and languages of those to whom and about whom we teach. So in conclusion, if we're going to realize locally relevant pedagogies in classrooms that are increasingly better at representing, including and affirming the limitless linguistically and culturally situated ways of being a gendered person in the world, we have to recognize the universality of feeling boxed in by the gendered boundaries that have been placed around our bodies and simultaneously lay bare and unscript all such normativities with our students. Gender just teaching entails an unequivocal investment in trans lives and a parallel divestment from systems and practices that lead to oppression. We must embrace liminality, infinite possibility, fluidity, and flexibility. 
We must assign value to the lives of people who unapologetically contain multitudes and or who exist in the in-between. We have to be comfortable with discomfort and we have to see incompleteness as whole. In short, if we are to leverage trans-affirming queer inquiry-based pedagogies to truly realize equitable and just language education, we have to all come to know, value, and center the voices of trans individuals and communities. With that, big thank you, and we will use whatever time we have left to discuss. I literally can't type fast enough to like quote you as many times as I want. I want to. I was like, doo, 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 and then I'd screw up a word and I was like, oh, friggin' A. And then, and then, like, thank goodness, like, Abby or somebody would tweet it and I was like, yeah, yeah, that, you know, like, what, what, <laughs> that amazing fast. Who blinks in your, in your tweets? And I'll, right. I'll fill words if I, I can. Thank you. Uh, it'll be like Mad Libs. <laughs> like, I haven't done Mad Libs in a long time. <laughs> he said, he, there was a noun here and I don't remember what it was. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I got like eight or nine pieces, but I was like, oh, thank goodness for the <laughs> captions and the transcript afterwards. Um, I have a couple, so I'm going to put a couple, um, of questions in one. Um, well, first of all, most important, not most importantly, but like most immediately, um, we have the handout link and I will put that again back in the, in the chat for download. Is it also possible to, or what are the limits for using and sharing um, like what you showed as a PDF or something like that if people wanna share it um, at their like department level or such, if you're open to that? Yeah, Pers from person to person, share as you like. Mm -hmm. and if um, you wanna share it on a larger scale, just email me and let me know um, what's up with it. I only, I oh, oops, I did a direct message. This is the... <laughs> It's my life on Zoom. Sorry. Oops, uh, just to you. Sorry. That is the actual PDF. If you want to share any of this um, broader than just sort of either tweeting out a few images or whatever, um, share the handout with anyone you want, whatever. Um, if you're like, I don't know, publishing a copy to your blog, maybe give me a heads up. I get a little nervous about um, those who shall not be named who are not trans affirming on the internet. Uh, Absolutely. Picking. So just all I ask is if it, if you have a doubt about whether it's a good idea to do it with the data, just ask me. I'm usually pretty quick with a Twitter reply or an email. You have both. I'll make sure I put it in here too. Absolutely. Just direct message it to all of it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> How my Basically. Zoom chat ends up being, I'm like, friggin' friggin'. Um, absolutely. What about, um, do you know of any resources or any handles that anybody can drop in the chat if they miss this question um, for like middle school teachers, once the the kind of intersection of puberty and language teaching and, you know, are, it's all fun and games until all of a sudden somebody, you know, that that's all very delicate kind of um, for a lot of people. And obviously we all teach in different situations. So there's no whatever. Can you think, um, have, do you have any experience with that? Or can you think of any resources or handles that um, people could do some research on? Mm -hmm. The first thing I would recommend is to everyone at any level who's nervous about how this will go down in the classroom. Uh, Joshua Pias has a recent book called Queering the English Classroom. Mm. And, um, it's definitely written more for a college level, but he has a really good chapter on proactively planning for resistance. So thinking about who your allies are, thinking about what your constraints are. Um, so I would recommend that as a general resource to anyone who's like, I want to do this and I'm a little scared. The other thing I'll recommend is feel free to let me know why you're scared. You saw in your handout, the first thing was a survey. I'm trying to figure out What's holding people back? What's motivating people to continue? How is this playing out in K-12 environments? And how can I spend my work time figuring out what to make to help support you better? So that's the other part is, if there's nothing to be found on the internet about it, let me know and I'll get to work. Um, the other thing I'll say is, I think Rena might be on this call. Rena Mazur, M-A-Z-O-R, I can find a Twitter handle. Uh, I think is teaching younger students, but tends to post a lot of really good ideas. And I know 
and I'm forgetting Joseph. Parody Brown is on this call and also is often um, taking this work up in really interesting and useful ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are a couple people to follow if you're on Twitter. I would also think that in your handout or in a chapter that I wrote, I think it's in your handout. I should have prepared the K-12 questions, I apologize. I oh, no worries. Well, I'll tell you, yeah, Joseph um, Prody Brown is the one who had me as a Spanish teacher say, like he was, Joe, I think it was Nectful last year or the year before, I don't know, they all run together, but I think it was last year, maybe Skolt, I don't know. <laughs> He's my conference, my conference buddy. I was in his session and I remember him just casually dropping like and just call them like ellen law words and you know when somebody says something like nonchalant and then like keeps going and the rest is like burp, 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 burp. it's like charlie mm -hmm. brown's teacher i was like what have i been doing for 14 years because i've been like this one's masculine this one's feminine even though it's your pencil and you identify as female it's still gonna be and they're all just like what like it's it ends up just being this like run around conversation for no reason for no reason because we all know that if they're like donde esta uh la lapis no one like faints out of confusion like no one walks away like oh absolutely not it's you know like no people just keep on they don't even blink at that why am i so and so this last year and a half um ish mm -hmm. i can't remember whenever that conference was it's been l words la words los words and last words and kids are like cool and they move on mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh my, oh my God, what, what is, what have I been doing? <laughs> I, I, I find that we are the ones who are, tend to be um, more worried than they are. They're just like. 100%. With some exceptions, but mostly, okay. Right. Bill Van Patten said last week that we create patterns, like the same way we see constellations. Cause like the big dipper is mm -hmm. always up there. And he's like, yeah, but you change mm -hmm. angles and those stars don't make the big dipper anymore. Like people created patterns just to make sense of things. Mm -hmm. And we do that with language. And every time he says that, I'm like, man, yeah, like we're making up rules. And like you said, with the colors, we're making up all these things for teaching, not for mm -hmm. learning. We're focusing on what we're doing, not how students are actually, you know, acquiring language. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, oh, Sam, it was Joe Prody Brown was the L and law words. Joe, uh, wave. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> He's like, about three rows, three, three rows down. down. Third row down. No, <laughs> <laughs> At Senora Parodi um, on Twitter. I think that's your professional account. Yeah, I always want to, you have two. Um, there was something else. Let's see, where did you go? Karen, da, 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 da. there was another question in my notes. Um, I also, what I thought about what you were saying made me think of that. I feel like we have um, this conversation a lot with teaching versus learning. Which one are we focusing on? And you saying for us to, you know, decenter our power is, I think, what makes a lot of people uncomfortable um, at first, you know, and, and we've all been there in some way when you're like, but I don't know about that thing. But what, what am I supposed to say if I don't know about that thing? I have to know all the things. What if students ask, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I find that really powerful on, um, you know, sort of taking, taking a step back and, and being vulnerable in that way. And I think as you do it, students tend to often be more motivated to step up and engage. Yeah. Uh, as, as you create space for them and, and as you say, I don't know this thing, I need to figure this out. Let's figure yeah. it out together. You're modeling the behavior that they need to learn how to do when they don't know something. Mm. And I, they also, the more I admit to them sometimes, I'm not sure, like let's, let's work on this, let's figure out the answer. The more than they say, I'm not sure, I don't know the answer to this question. Here's what I think it might be. What do you think? And we get to open up a lot more dialogue. That's why I think transaffirming pedagogy is about so much more mm. than inclusion. I think it's about using the way that of knowing and being in the world that comes with transpositionalities mm -hmm. to rethink our other ways of knowing and being in the world. Yeah, absolutely. What would you say to the people that, um, you know, say, like in Spanish, we have the Real Academia, you know, so it's like, but what about the, and, and I've seen native speakers argue, you know, say on Twitter and other really dignified places, um, this is not real. This is not like I'm from insert place here. 
nobody uses that. Everyone's going to be confused. The Real Academia says this and whatever. And then you've got a lot of people that say, what about AP? Like, what about, you know, blah, blah, blah. What, what, what's, a, what's a response mm -hmm. that someone can kind of keep in their arsenal to be able to say, besides everything that you've said, like all the 80,000 truth bombs, if they're still processing, is there any kind of comparison or metaphor that comes to mind for you? Yeah, I think I would break this up in a couple of ways. The first thing I would say is linguistic co-cultures exist. Mm. You probably already inhabit many of them. Has someone ever corrected the way you speak and you rolled your eyes and thought, okay, I'm not ending the sentence with a preposition. Everyone does. Right. Not that different, except that it's about trans people and so transphobia comes in mm. to explode the language attitude. Mm. The other thing I, that, that's sort of the piece that I use to combat the, it's not spoken. Lots of these little communities exist that you've never met just because you've never seen it does not mean it does not exist. Mm. Constantly unearthing and realizing that the world is more complex than we knew and that there are many experiences that fall outside of those that we're aware of. Yeah. The next thing, um, I would talk about is, I'll use the example of the Académie Française and I'm sure uh, the Real Academia mm -hmm, is not that much different. <laughs> um, for example, the Académie Française only accepted, <laughs> if I'm willing to give them that much power to use that word. Right. Uh, the feminization of titles and professions in Someone help me, 2019, I think it was. Ugh. And it was more than 70 years ago that this debate really kicked off. And it, things have been in practical use for a good amount of time. Mm. Would also argue that whatever, Spain, France, insert your monolithic target community uh, in here, whatever might be going on with so-called language authorities or even language on the ground there, we owe it to our students to meet them where they are. We already recognize that language classrooms are these sort of third spaces, hybrid spaces, right? Where students and their expectations are meeting teachers and their expectations are meeting this target culture. What we owe our students is a rich and accurate understanding of language as it is spoken. And that does not mean erasing anyone who dare go against dominant discourses and dominant language authorities. Mm. I guess I start with that. No, absolutely. Well, and I don't know why we think we would be any more of an expert like on those things than because as language teachers, unless you're lying to yourself and other people, um, you know, you you, we acknowledge that we look up words all the time. We learn new words all the time. I just learned bledo yesterday, which my Chilean colleague said, me importa un bledo. And I was like, that doesn't seem positive. Like, so I had to Google it and I was like, oh. And I came back to her, I was like, what was that word you said? I think I spelled it wrong. Uh, we learn things all the time. Why would we not think that we could learn, you know, and I always think of the maiden name thing. We have no problem saying, what, what's, what's Sally Sue's new last name, but then learning someone's pronouns is really inconvenient. You know, you'll learn new last names, you'll learn kids' names, you'll learn all the, you know, we'll learn all these things. And then it's like, mm, not that far though. Like, what do they want to be referred to? No, I don't think so. Like, what? That doesn't, how, how are those different? But I get it. You know, it's like you said, it's, it's discomfort, perhaps fear, I would say. I don't know if you'd agree. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely discomfort. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think that some people don't realize that they know how to do it mm. uh, and they're worried they're going to mess it up. And so that's also why I talk a lot about sort of releasing this need to perform expert because you are going to mess it up. Everyone messes up in general. Um, and then especially when you're learning to do something that you don't often do in language, that's not probably not a central part of the people that you're speaking with, right? It's not, it's not necessarily a part of your communities of practice. And so 
you have to learn how to be a part of these communities and learn how to say, oops, I made a mistake. I play with my students a game called Find the Mistake. Uh, and I keep points for them over a semester of how many mistakes of mine they've found. Uh, and they're on like teams and whoever, whatever team finds most, the most of my mistakes gets a, some sort of prize, you know, games. Uh, I love games too, it's fun. Um, but <laughs> I think that this language change shouldn't be treated differently than other language change. Mm. Because the difference between how you feel about yell versus how comfortable you are perhaps looking at this and saying this is not an ordi phone, a computer phone, mm. you just call it tablet or whatever, a smartphone, a smartphone. If you're comfortable anglicizing this, and not even that pronouns are anglicization because they're not, but if you're comfortable with that, you should be equally comfortable with saying, hey, there are other aspects of language that are changing and mm. don't follow these prescriptive rules. And the only difference between those two is transphobia and cisnormativity. Mm. And I, I think the other thing I'd say to people who are really resistant is it's okay to admit that that's where you are, so long as you commit to getting past that, right? We are all living in a cisnormative world. So I, we all, I will say even the most proverbially woke person in the world is going to have cisnormative thoughts because those are the thoughts mm. that the world around you is setting up for you to have. And so learning to think differently and engage differently has to be about breaking with those. Mm -hmm. The prizes for mistakes can just be uh, a game or something too. <laughs> Free prizes, Kelly. Free prizes. <laughs> I know she said she said in the chat like to like I can't afford that I'm like I know say don't trust me to make anything with choices or a word bank there's going to be three left over I'm going to say they're right it's not happening like it's not going to go well um I hear you saying that just as we wrap up here about um you know and like you said sort of everybody everybody's going to misstep and I think that's super powerful and you know, then I think to, I think to moments when I've thought, okay, have I made a misstep or is this going to come across as performative? Um, you know, we've mentioned in the chat, like different social media platforms and wondering when like, you know, French teacher, I think Teresa mentioned like French teachers in the US is very um, trans affirming. I think that's what she said. Quick, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, like, so when people get fired up and say, but AP, but the whatever, but the, they're like, like admins of the page, like kind of swoop in like, yeah, no, we're not doing that here. So, um, you know, things like that. And so I wonder, um, I think at least I hope that's kind of what you were communicating, Teresa. Um, <laughs> that's how I read it. Um, yeah. See, I lift off. Like a lot of those are very supportive, you know, um, and not performative in that way. Is there a way we can avoid, besides educating ourselves, obviously, and those norms you gave for ethically, um, you know, presenting information and engaging in, in conversation, do we just have to know in our hearts that it's not performative in our lives when we share on these forums and when we have conversations with the people in our lives? Um, do you feel like that's a worry a lot of people have? I see that a lot of people saying this person's performative or this person's, you know, and, and, and it's not really, who's to know if it's up for debate, you know, like we'll never actually know if you don't know the people in real life. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yeah, so I think, I think there are multiple ways to think about this. The first thing is we can never know intentions. That's, mm -hmm. I, I will, the hill I'm willing to die on. You can never know someone's intention as much as you want to. And so I think you know your own intentions. And then I think you also can read your feedback. If you have five people going off on you on Twitter that you're performative, mm. it's Twitter. If you have 10, 15 people or someone messages you with a caring and kind engagement, Mm. then you probably need to in your own practices. Mm -hmm. In one of the publications that 
I linked in the chat and it's also in the handout, the um, teaching trans book chapter. I have this sort of list of guiding questions. And I think this kind of work is like most social justice work. You have to continually be asking yourself, is what I'm doing, does, is what I'm doing sort of meshing with the feedback that I'm getting from the world? Is it meshing with what I'm learning? Do I need to adjust? And if you sort of sit down and are quiet and, and really pay attention and really reflect, I, I think there's a whole lot of mess that can happen in this discourse about performativity. Mm. You can ask yourself, am I stepping up when it's not easy? Because that's what's not performative. Mm -hmm. When, when uh, I don't know, when there's a trans kid at my school and there's some nonsense about bathrooms, am I speaking up even though it's uncomfortable for me to say to my principal, you know, I hear that you think it's problematic to do this, but that is a major concern. Mm. Forming coalitions that, that, that take up real action that engages with the, li the real lived experiences and material conditions of trans people. And if you're doing things that are hard to do and in a way that the communities that you're trying to show allyship to mm -hmm. uh, are directing, then, then I think you're on the right page, right? I, I, I don't often use ally, I like to use accomplice mm. because I think that distinction also makes the difference um, between this, I love everyone and I have no discriminations at the interpersonal level and the fact that most of the things that we're talking about are really structural concerns, mm. much bigger than are you nice to me when we pass each other in the hallway? Right? Like, yep. it's nice to be nice. I'd like some civil rights. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't mean to be, to be flippant, but no. I, that's, that's a big difference for me. An, an accomplice mm. is doing the work at the direction of the people who are facing the consequences. Mm. And you're stepping up in the ways that you're being signaled to step up. You're not waiting for someone to say, hey, um, I don't know, what can I pick? Hey, uh, please don't dead name me. Instead, you're at the start of class going, hey, if anyone thinks there's a chance that I don't have the right name on the, on the sheet for you, let me know. You're saying, everybody just write your name on a piece of paper and pass it in and then you're double checking it. Mm. Those are things where you, you're, you're knowing what you know and you're trying to anticipate. Mm -hmm. And then if someone tells you, oh, you made us go around in a circle and say our names and pronouns and that made me really uncomfortable, then you're going back and sitting with yourself and going, okay, I thought I was being inclusive. Mm. Feedback that that was a harmful practice. What do I know or where might I be able to go to try to figure out what to do? Mm. And that's sort of, to me, the, the path forward. Well, and logistically, not logistically, fundamentally, that you've created or cultivated, I guess not created is not the word, cultivated and grown and curated the relationships that allow that student to give you that feedback to go, hey, I was mm -hmm. uncomfortable doing X and Y, because if they won't mm -hmm. even get to that point, mm -hmm. You know, then why would they tell you later on, you know, if you took a misstep or if you students at that point are just like, eh, screw it. They don't, you know, he doesn't care. She doesn't care. They don't care, whatever. And I think we, I think, especially with names, especially again, with pronouns, with a lot of, a lot of identifiers, um, I, I, we make a lot of missteps and we don't, we don't know till we know. And it's a lot, a lot of times later when, if they do feel like they can trust us and, you know, that's hard. It's really hard. Yeah, I like, I, I just want to call out what Teresa put in the chat because I think it's a really important one. Um, thank you for the kind words about pointing out that pronouns are temporary. Mm. Uh, I, that's another thing that I think is important. 
um, in the same way that we don't need to know, our students also don't need to know for themselves sometimes. Mm. I think we need to normalize not knowing. We need to know, normalize unknowing, re-knowing. Mm. Things shift and change. I don't know about you, but my relationship to language in general has changed over the years. And I, I, what we might feel comfortable using in one context or at one moment in time is not necessarily what's going to hold forever. Mm. And it doesn't have to. And so those regular check-ins, I think, are important. And the fact that you recognize that, I think will also say a lot um, to students. One other thing, you notice that I said probably gestures toward masculinity, gestures towards femininity. It's not just because uh, I was trying to be hyper academic and show that I'm smart. Um, I say those things because we have to also remember that pronouns don't really tell us that much about anyone's gender to begin with. Mm. Just because mm. I use he pronouns does not necessarily mean that I am a man. It means that I have chosen a piece of my language to sort of say, yeah, masculine more than feminine or non-binary. Mm. But anyone can use any pronoun in any context at any time. When I say we don't want to pin things down, that goes right down to the exact, not even just the options that we have, but also the option that we choose at any given moment. Mm. I'm thinking of a conversation a couple of years ago too. I had, uh, he was on the call a minute ago, but um, I think he's left. JC Morales out of uh, Miami. He's amazing. And a couple of years ago, I had shared something on Twitter. Um, and yeah, I, he texted me like, I just, so you know, that question on number five would have terrified me at 15. And it was very like, um, just very heteronormative. And, you know, I was just trying, I was just trying of his like innocent linguistic notions. I literally just wanted them to use ear plus a plus infinitive, like sort of simple future. And it was like, you know, where are you going to live in five years? So kind of innocent enough. But then the one he was referring to was, um, you know, is it important that your future partner like be whatever, like characteristics, you know, so would you rather have smart or would you rather be with someone? Are you going to be with someone smart or whatever? And he's like, mm -hmm. at 15, I wasn't out yet. I wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, this, that, and, and the thought of a prospective partner, hypothetically of either, you know, any kind of qualifier was, was terrifying. And I thought, God, I didn't even think about that. And that's what this reminds me of a lot of those things that were like, wait, but that was just, doesn't matter. Didn't yeah. Matter. I didn't even I'm think like, that gender was relevant. Yeah, or sexuality was relevant in your case. 100%. Yeah. 100%. I think um, like a lot of people who teach older people don't think in, in parallel with that sort of not thinking about asking about potential imaginary partners. Right? A lot of people also don't think when people are older asking about childhood. Yeah. And asking for childhood photos, like the child, bring your childhood photo into work. That's really not fun. Right, right. Like, no, and thank you. So, like some of the things that I try to do is I'll always have one extra question on most of the things that I ask students to do. And so maybe I have 11 questions. I say, pick 10. And there's always one that you can throw away in case you're upset or like if in case you're upset by it or, or you're like, I don't know how to navigate this or, or whatever. Yeah. Well, how many times do we pick activities like that and projects like Teresa mentioned the family tree, God, the bane of my existence, mm -hmm. <laughs> things like that, like the family tree, your ideal house design in a shoe box, kill me now. Like, I really can't like, don't make me, uh, I hate it all. Um, and how many times do we give things like that? Because we feel like they're safe. We already have the rubric. Somebody gave us the handout. Like we've got all the stuff. We checked all the boxes. Great. It's going to be no problem. And it's actually super problematic in a lot of ways and we feel like we mm -hmm. can't not assign it or we have to do some kind of project Ugh. and then who gets more points the kids who bring like you said more childhood photos the family tree is like paper mache and like has fancy glue and crap and it's still labeling mm -hmm. and it was really well, upsetting for some students and then it's also but it's, it's it's so problematic and yet it's so easy to fix right Right. The family tree, all you have to do is say, you can either do your family tree 
or you can make up what you think would be the insert adjective mm. funniest coolest best most interesting family options yeah or draw your own characters nothing no one can be humans and you have to make a family like right absolutely that allows allowing students flexibility gets around so many of those really awful moments yeah. and as you do it hey i really appreciated that you asked what parent number one uh or uh someone who cares for me number one is you know yeah. like it's the same sort of attitude as with other things like I, i'm Yay. saying same a lot and so now i have to all on a quick tangent and say we should also be careful not to say just like <laughs> mm. i fall into the trap often here's my uh decentering my myself and calling myself out but sometimes just like makes us really a lot more comfortable. And so when I'm trying to make people more comfortable, I often do the just like game. But we have to remember after we think the just like to make ourselves comfortable, we have to also remember that gender is not just like sexuality. Mm. It's not just like, there are differences that are meaningful that we have to attend to. So we can use just like to get ourselves in the room and say, okay, it's just like that. I know how to do that. I'll be there. And now I have to think about all the ways that it's not just like that at all. Wow. I have to call myself out. That's, a, that's an easy, but not easy. That's a very concrete step though, uh, that we can do, like that we need to be doing right now. I mean, it's, it's changing your, it's changing your letter to parents instead of saying parents guardians. I've started this year because a colleague kept, I kept hearing her say it and then it finally sunk in somewhere. And so now all my videos address like, hi, you know, my name is Meredith. I'm at Peachtree Ridge. I am uh, the Spanish teacher of a child in your care. And I try, and it's like, oh my God, you know, every time I'm going like, let me be really careful. And, and I think, um, you know, we have to acknowledge the privilege of not paying attention, like not being careful, or if someone finds it annoying or needs a just like comparison, that's a level of privilege that's pretty, um, you know, pretty problematic. Mm -hmm. And yet, as you start to do these little shifts, that's the other thing I think that I hear in what you're saying is you're like, now when I do my videos and I have to think, but eventually Absolutely. I have to think, but it's, mm -hmm. it's sort of how do you eat an elephant situation? Yep. One bite at a time. Yep. Just do one thing better today than you did yesterday and just keep building the habits, you know? Um, yeah. I, I think as you sort of have this habit of always questioning yourself, always revising, we already have that as teachers. Like that is what makes most good teachers. You're already going, mm, what could I do better? Mm -hmm. All you have to do that is remember that it's not just what you think of as your pedagogy, but it's also all of the relational aspects of what you do. So it's how can I do better in my content? But your content is how people mm -hmm. and language interface. So how can I do better with those relationships, with those connections, with those interfaces? Mm. Absolutely, people first. When you put people first, the rest falls in place. We're so flexible in so many ways, like you said, as teachers, and then we're so suddenly inflexible. Like we will go to the, we will bend over backwards to do this and post this. And then suddenly somebody draws a line in the sand and says, you know, uh, it's like meatloaf, but I won't do that. You know, like all of a sudden, like, nope, but I'm not learning. And I don't know how that happened. Like, I mean, we know how it happens, but to me, it's so bizarre, especially as language teachers. Um, we know that there are a million words for socks and for house and versus home and shoe. And we have no problem a lot of times mm -hmm. teaching kids umbrella terms for whatever, but then something that's out of our scope of understanding is suddenly well, no, you know, and we just all the, like you said, all the phobias come in and yeah, that's a lot. Chris, I took up, I took up more time than I told you we would. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't even care. It's fine. I don't mind if people have burning so, questions. We so appreciate don't mind you. rounding out the half hour with anyone. I mean, it's like a telethon. We almost said, yeah. <laughs> we all, if anybody remembers uh, those, like guys, we got to pledge $50, you know, or an absolute, <laughs> whatever, why not? Um, I am going to, just for those who are still here, which is fantastic, the recording will be, if that's okay with you, Chris, I know that was like part of the, okay. Um, whew, I'm waiting for one person to go, I don't remember you asking that. And I'm like, oh, I swear I did. But- I'll tell uh, you both, I don't remember and I don't care. So. <laughs> okay. 
That's a good autobiography title. That sounds like college to me. I don't remember and I don't care. <laughs> it is a pretty story of my life. <laughs> story of life. Um, yeah, it'll be so that short um, bit.ly slash six Fs and then 2021 has somewhere on like slide three-ish. It's just an interactive slideshow like in present mode already. So just like click forward and you'll see it's like my Bitmoji watching TV just because I couldn't find anything else holding a remote at the time. And um, on TV, I'm just, I'm watching the, the playlist of the recording. So just click where it says click here and um, all of the recordings will be there. I'll change the Bitmoji to not be me, but I was like, oh, we gotta have something watching TV. Um, I can't think of any questions that we missed in the chat. I hope I consolidated them. We tried to, you know, a lot of, a lot of like-minded folks, which is really nice because, you know, you have to go back to your department. We all know where we teach and whether it's grammar or, you know, race, gender, like whatever it is we're talking about that gets people all fired up, you still have to go back and have conversations with real people. And I really appreciate questions that um, are vulnerable in that way. And when people acknowledge, like I, get, you know, I have questions and the people I work with are going to, you know, they're going to react like this, or they're going to say mm -hmm. this. And this is my mm -hmm. real situation. My grandma used to say, it's a dirty bird that messes its own nest. Um, so you really can't do that at work. I mean, if you, if you like where you are, we're all employed, we're super, uh, you know, if you're employed, if you're gainfully employed, um, we're lucky. And I know a lot of those hard conversations, that's why they're hard conversations to have with people in your workplace, you know, where you live in a lot of ways. And so I'm appreciative for um, everyone asking and, and contributing and everything. So email me if you'd like a, um, I'll put my email in the chat again. Um, if you'd like a transcript, the transcript. So kind of with the captions recorded and, and the chat as well. I have access to both of those with this fancy Zoom school account. <laughs> I don't know when they're gonna shut this off, but until then, woo, we got up to 300 attendees, baby. Uh, we can do whatever we want. Um, and I can, and I'll record, I'll post the recording right away. So Chris, any, any parting thoughts or words or any other, I don't know, things for us to consider? Make it count. Um, I will say, follow me on Twitter. I'm going off about related topics regularly. So if you're on there and doing already, it's a good place to stay in contact. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise I will say, I'll sign off with this. Remember, you know your context. You know your allies. Mm. You know where is a good place to start with this and start there. You don't have to do it all for it to be meaningful mm. to give yourself time to work on this. This is a long-term thing. Start, build, and give yourself grace as you work to do better because some of you may have already known better before we ever got on this call, but some of you are learning to do better tonight. Mm -hmm. So what can you do tomorrow? Something very simple. Maybe you're gonna write something on the board and you're gonna leave it open a little bit. The other thing I'll say is I have taught about these topics in Georgia in South Carolina, in South Dakota, in Wisconsin, and in Arizona, in very different institutions, in very different contexts. It looked very different every time, but it was always possible. So try something, do anything, and that's good. Thank you for coming.